Hey, 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 guys, it is Allison. I am the host of your show, Allison Answers Mission Awake. I cannot wait to sit down with you today and go over how we are going to crush the mediocrity in your life that has been plaguing our society since the beginning of time. I cannot wait to have a real deal conversation that includes intelligence, fun, excitement, and real actionable steps to make a real difference in the life that you're living now and making it into something you can be damn proud of and excited to live. Sit down, put on your damn seatbelt, and get ready for the ride of your life. Hey guys, today's show, Allison Answers, has uh, a really cool guest. His name is Bradley Roth. And he is not only a friend, he is just a real incredible badass dude. And the thing that I love about him is his natural down to earth style that you would never realize how much uh, he has to offer, how much he has to share. And what I want to say to you guys is this, is that really listen in because Bradley is a quieter man, but he's a man that has incredible insight and wisdom. So without any further ado, let me explain to you basically his bio and I'll be reading it. He's an entrepreneur. He's a personal development junkie, a coach, a podcaster. He's he's the type of guy that's infinitely curious. Um, He says, his quote is, I try to avoid defining who I am by what I do, but I know that people on here on are looking for like breaking mediocrity. And that's what he's all about. This is a quote from him. First off, I rarely have and probably never will confine myself to one particular thing or avenue. I'm always involved in multiple projects. So I'll share a little about my two main projects. And I'll tell you what they are. He has an amazing podcast that just draws incredible guests, guests who are like not most people. And what I love about Bradley is that he came up with that name because he realized that who he is and who he's drawn to is people who are not most people. And that's who he is interacts with, that's who he resonates with, and that's who he has on his podcast. And basically what he's about is about being allergic to mediocrity, groupthink, and following the status quo. Beyond running his own podcast, he also enjoys helping others launch their podcast. He's he's very, very generous with that. Um, He is into developing programs and coaching and creating communities, which he has done with his Alliance program, which is really also cool. Uh, What I love about Bradley, I met him through Arate, which is a group a lot of you understand and know that I'm involved with. It's people who are driven. It's people who are really, really, truly allergic to mediocrity and settling. We believe that success is our obligation. And Bradley on his podcast, he has people who are successful. They stand out. They're achievers. They're people of excellence. They're winners. They're nonconformists. They're free thinkers. They're people who are contrarians, unscripted. He he just lets it flow on his podcast. So without any further ado, I really just want you to just kind of hone in on our conversation because whenever Bradley and I get together, he's such an intelligent man. We just go from all different kinds of things, from the quantum field to neuroscience, to mediocrity, to business, to anything that is on the ends of the bell curve, that's where Bradley is. So I am really just honored to have him. And I hope that you guys really, really enjoy who he is, what he's about, what he has to offer you. He also has a group called the Alliance, which is this developing profound um, you know, community of people that actually I'm about to join. And it's just, I know a lot of the people in it. And it's just a place where people um he's he's having uh meetups and it's a place really where people can grow and learn and i'll let him explain more of that to you uh thanks so much for listening and 
really, really listen to how you can develop your mind and move out of mediocrity yourself today. Be blessed. Hey, 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 guys, how are you today? It is Allison from Allison Answers and Logger Counseling Services. So today I have, which I mentioned in the beginning, in the intro, I have Bradley Roth. But the way today is going to go is going to be interesting because I just feel like I could talk to Bradley like he is like, I don't know, like my best friend or brother or something who's just like hanging out in my house with me. So I feel like he's just a natural guy who has so much to offer, so much unique ability, so much um, interest and, you know, curiosity. And he just, he just if he, he's a he, he's low key in his voice but he packs a punch so i want i'm just going to ask you guys to really you know focus focus people <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to hear things that have the power to change your life he has so many areas of success and i always one of the things about you bradley i want to say is that i trust you mm. i really mean that i trust you um on a lot of different levels. So I trust you as a human being and like your value system, just you and Nancy, like you and your your wife and just who you are and how you live your life is just so, one of the things that, that has drawn me to Bradley is that he is the farthest thing from the norm, mediocre. Mm -hmm. Like he just is just completely against that as I am. And I just feel like, but he's so, He's such a leader that you, you'd be feel compelled to follow because, and I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm really honestly just saying this about you. I hope that's okay. But it's like, you have like this unassuming way that's, um, very, but it's very leading. Like you're, you're influential because you feel so trustworthy and grounded to me. I feel like whatever you say, like, if you say, like when you do your podcast, I feel like you, um, I trust that you're just going to do the best job. Like the, mm. the way you do the notes. I mean, God, this guy makes me look like shit, honestly. <laughs> if you could see like what, the way he does his notes for the podcast. But anyhow, so Bradley, let's get right into it. I'm going to, I want to start with asking you about kind of how you have gotten to where you are today. We've already discussed that, but if you could give just a brief background about any of your struggles or how you ended up being in the place you are and the direction that you're going and explain that. Well, first off, before I get into that, I want to say thank you so much for that intro. That's probably <laughs> honestly like the best intro I've ever had or been introduced or anything like that. Uh, I just told the truth. That's all. Yeah. Well, because also it like wasn't just reading off the bio, you know, that yeah. was like straight off the cuff and about the qualities and stuff. So uh, I really, really appreciate that. That was awesome. And uh, I know like anyone who's listening, they probably think like I, <laughs> based off that, you know, some like business mogul and, and crushing <laughs> it in all these different ways. But I would say that's, um, you know, I don't know if that's true yet. Uh, I would say like, it's it's hard to give a background because it's been so indirect kind of how yeah. I got here. There's no like straight line path. I know everyone kind of says that, but it started like growing up. I was homeschooled. I was um, kind of, I don't know, I, I had strict parents or protective parents, religious. And I, I always kind of, now I'm grateful for that. But at the, when I was younger, I resented it. I wanted to like kind of break free. I wanted to do what the other kids did and and that kind of stuff. And so it caused me to kind of question and push back and um, I always ask why in my head. And so, like you said, I'm, I'm curious, I'm always kind of like running everything through that filter. Does this make sense? Um, does this align with me? And so growing up, I had that, but I think it was more subconscious. I didn't, I wasn't really aware of it until probably like somewhere in college, post-college certain things in school. I was like, you know, why are, why are we learning this? This is not really relevant to me or my life and paying a fortune for it. And, all this stuff. And then getting out, I got into the gym setting. Like that was what I went to school for exercise science. I was working in the gym for like five years. I said, this is going to be my career. And I had never been exposed to entrepreneurship growing up. Like I didn't know a single entrepreneur. I didn't know that was a thing or a business owner, 
whatever you want to call it. And so I'm working in the gym. I realized that where I'm at, it's part-time. It's not going to cover like what I need it to long-term. And so I started looking for these other things and I knew I wasn't really employable on a regular nine to five kind of uh, setting. So I knew I had to find something that was kind of like self-paced, had some freedom. So I got into real estate that turned out to not be the answer (laughs) for me. (laughs) I struggled through that for a few years. I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, eventually found out it was time to move on, especially because I caught the travel bug. And so being a realtor, it's, you can't travel. You're kind of glued to one place, you know, your home territory. And so I said, okay, what else can I do? And I uh, got into network marketing a little bit and that was useful, but that was also not the long-term answer, but getting into those things kind of like gave me a little taste of these things that I'd never been exposed to, like the need for marketing, sales, personal development, understanding people, like these things that growing up, I never paid attention to, or anyone really taught me about. It was I was just an athlete. That was like my identity. And so I started getting into these things. I said, oh, I can do digital marketing. I kind of like the the psychology of it and that kind of thing. So I'm going to help local businesses. And so I just like jumped off the cliff with that into entrepreneurship. I had no income. I had no savings. I had no mentors. (laughs) I I like, and and it showed, you know, I I struggled through that for several years. Uh, I got some clients here and there, had some wins, probably a lot more losses. And, uh, you know, leverage my over leveraged myself, kind of used a, like credit cards and stuff to prop that up and keep things going. And so I dug myself into a pretty sizable financial hole, um, which I still have not made my way out of. And, but I learned a lot, you know, I kind of got like the on the job business degree in a sense. Yeah. And then during that time, I realized that psychology and coaching and connecting with people and learning about how people think was what really like kind of lit me up and what I was really interested in. So I got into personal development. I went to a Tony Robbins event in 2017 that changed my life. And I, I learned that coaching was like a profession and (laughs) (laughs) and I was like, man, I want to do something in this, but I didn't know what. So I was kind of still doing the the online marketing and hanging on to that. And then uh, I decided that I had I had this concept, not most people, which we we I'm sure we'll talk about in the back oh, of my mind. Tell, for years. You, you're gonna you're gonna explain that, I'll, right? I'll get to that. Yeah. Later? Okay. Yeah. So I, I had this concept because again, I questioned things. And then it was also this realization, like I grew up in kind of your standard like middle class uh home where it was like you go to college, you get a degree, and you have a career, and that's like success. And to me, I started being like, that's to me, that's not really my definition of success. And every, everyone, like, as I got into personal development, I'm learning, I'm reading, I'm listening to all these people who are, who actually are successful on a scale that like, I never knew anyone like that. And everything they're telling me is like the opposite of everything I've been told by society, by the school system, by everyone growing up. So I said, okay, like this doesn't make sense. And then the main thought, I think that kind of kicked it off was most people aren't very Like I'm just reading and then one day it came to me, I think it was probably 2019, 2018. And I was like, in my head, I said, okay, most people aren't really happy. Most people aren't really wealthy and most people aren't very healthy. So why would I want to be like most people or think and act like most people? That was just kind of like, I'm all, I always process with logic. I'm a logic first person. And so that was the thought that set it off. And I said, huh, I have this like concept, not most people but I didn't know what the heck to do with it. My greatest fear growing up was public speaking. I I would like sweat and shake and didn't sleep for weeks leading up to any time I had to speak into, in front of a group of even like three people. And uh, so I said, okay, like I have this concept, but I'm terrified to do anything with it. I'm, I'm not going to do YouTube. I can't stand the sound of my own voice played back to me. And so I just sat on the concept for a few years and I joined the Arate Syndicate, which is where we met back in 2020. And I got invited onto a podcast with uh, a mutual friend, Alex Vonderhaar. And yeah, and he's a big marketing guy. I was still in marketing at the time. I was doing chatbots, which was kind of different. And so he had me on. It was like a 20-minute episode. Didn't go well. I was like (laughs) super nervous. It was just Zoom. And I got off of that and I was like, man, I I think I botched it. And and then I got invited onto another one. I said, all right, I'll try one more. Um, and I went on this one and it was more about like kind of the journey and the mindset and the story and that kind of stuff. And hour plus later, we're still rolling, having a good time. I shut my laptop after that. That was November of 2020. I said, all right, 
not most people is going to be a podcast. Like that was the moment. And then I said, I'm going to have this thing launch in two months by January. I'll be up and rolling. And it took me until mid March, because as you know, there's a lot that goes into a podcast, yeah. especially when you're doing everything yourself. Mm-hmm. So I started the podcast. It was just going to be a side hustle, not, not even a side hustle, just a passion project, something I felt like I needed to do. And my marketing experience, even though it never really like took off for me in terms of like building a client list, it really trans- translated well into podcasting. So I had a good branding. I had good messaging. And uh, again, it had been in my head for a few years. So everything was very thought out and dialed in for like to start. And so uh, I launched a podcast. I got some pretty cool guests on in the beginning. I think you were one of the yeah. early ones. And <laughs> am I in that lineup actually considered a cool guest? That's pretty for sure. Pretty yeah, nice you you were the first you to say you were the first guest I had where we went so long that I had to cut it into a part one and a part two. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, that was and really so cool conversation. Uh, and so I just started getting all this positive feedback about the podcast, like more in the first like three weeks of that than I had in three years of digital marketing. And so I was kind of all, like hanging on by a thread already with the online marketing, like just because I didn't really see another alternative at the moment. But this, I was like a few months in, I found myself spending like almost no time on the market, like, because this was giving me so much energy. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to jump off the cliff again and go all in on this. I don't know how, but uh, the first thing I started, I did was create a podcasting course because I was like, you know, that's something I can like that's how I can leverage this into maybe a little bit of income. And so I did that. I had some people buy it. Most people didn't go through it <laughs> just like any <laughs> online course, right? Like only 10% of courses get finished online or right. I think it's even less than that. And um, anyways, so then, then I kind of, I was like, how can I build out this brand, this community? And um, so I did some more podcast education, but then I started doing in this past year, back in April, I launched, it's called the Not Most People Alliance. It's our like online community, bringing people together. Cause that's, that's a big thing of mine. It's funny. Cause like, I'm not really naturally an extrovert, but I do enjoy like bringing like-minded people together and making connections and introducing people and that sort of thing. So I started that. Um, and then also started doing some live events recently, which like was never on my radar, never something I thought I would do like speaking on stage, even if it's for five minutes And then interviewing people live on stage in front of an audience, like just if you would have told me two, three years ago, I would have said, yeah, right. Like get out of here. Like that's, that's not me. Never will be me. Um, But it's just funny how things kind of evolve and happen. And then, I don't know, like, it's hard to speak when you say all like successful in all these areas. I feel like, um, I feel like when you look at the health, wealth relationships triad that we hear about how everything kind of falls into those three buckets, I find that most people have one that they kind of naturally excel in one of those areas, one that's kind of like in the middle, like that they, they, if you put a little bit of work in, you can do well. And then one that's like a struggle and that's not true for everyone, but that tends to be kind of how things go. And so for me, like the health side of things, like I was an athlete growing up, like that's, that always came super easy to me. The relationships part, I struggled with mightily high school, college. I went to like an all girl, all, uh, all guys, high school, <laughs> they all girl school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I wish, but, and then, uh, <laughs> and then I was homeschooled. So I didn't have like any interaction with women until like college. Yeah. And so I like really kind of was like, lack, like behind on that. I was a little bit of a hopeless romantic, but like I started reading books and learning about like, you know, all that stuff. And now, and then I met my wife, Nancy almost eight years ago now. And, um, you know, so that area of my life was really has been solid for a while and I just have to say that she's perfect oh thank you she is she's really good good stuff that girl yeah that woman yeah we we make a great team and uh and so that I mean obviously that's had its challenges and ups and downs and then that third area the wealth part that's that's been like my Achilles heel is figuring that out because I kind of chase my passions before profit like I'll jump into something if I'm excited about it, even if it's not necessarily, you know, going to be super profitable right off the bat. Like there's been so many jobs that I'm like, oh, man, I, I could really use that money, but it's not going to, I know like my gut says that I need to just do this instead. And so I've kind of, uh, I don't know, you, you see I'm 31 now and a lot of my friends are like getting established in their careers. And I still, I'm still like in startup mode and still kind of figuring things out, but it's just always that kind of pursuit, that balance. And I feel like once I kind of get a little bit of a better handle 
on that side of things, then I'll, I'll be able to say, okay, I have like a, a solid balance. So it's still a work in progress and I'm just being transparent with people and, um, and just building relationships. And I know like long-term, if you do the right things for long enough, like eventually it's, it's all going to come around. I, I know I just have to say that so much, but what it reminds me of, and I hear, when I hear you talk like this, I feel like this is your wealth. Like mm. when you first started talking and I'm listen, I'm not, I'm not just like, you know, this is not just flattery. This is, I'm being very genuine about what I'm saying it's like when you started talking and you were like, oh, you know, you make it sound like I'm a business mogul or something. And then, but what came to my mind right away is that I see you like that. Mm. It, the, to me, the, the actual thing that's happening current day reality does not necessarily need to be there because like you can see, like I can see future. Like I feel like, I feel like when I look at people, you can see even... So you're on a path where you're creating and building all these things now, learning and building and developing yourself and relationships, which I know you know this, but I can see your future. I, mm. I'm positive of it. Like, and when I see you, I see you as a very, very successful man. And the reason that I see that I'm going to tell you is because if you think about the people who are willing to, first of all, to go on your podcast. The people who, you know, you draw people to you who are good. You draw mm. people to you who are successful. And it has to do with like who you are as a person, I think. And what stood out to me, I'm, I'm thinking you probably read Emily's book, Emily Frisella, Relationships, Passion, Profit, or whatever, <laughs> Relationships First. I just like love the book, but mm. basically it reminded me of that. When you're saying you put passion before profit, that's where success builds like you're yeah. building relationships community you're staying true to yourself you're staying true to not following the path that everyone else is following mm -hmm. and your return you're you're investing now you're going to have a, this unbelievable return i just know it i mean do you feel yeah. that you see it i do and and i remind myself of that because i think most people think again most people not most people like most people think very short term yes and they think you know, how can I win today or tomorrow? Not how can I win big, you know, months or years from now? Uh, so I have, I haven't read that book yet, but I, I've seen it. And I know that like, I'm like, I have an idea of what's in it and I know it would resonate with me. And I think that way. And I just, I don't, I don't even know where it kind of started, where I started to understand the power of relationships. Maybe it was Arate when I joined a couple of years ago, maybe it was after that, but um, I just know like, Right. They say it's all about who you know, and it's that was always kind of like, oh, you'll get like the the shortcut if you know the right people, and it's true, you know, like you, you know the right people, like like being an RT and building those relationships. That's what allowed me to then call in like all these awesome guests right at the beginning of the podcast, right, and help me get off to a good start. And then when I started the alliance you know, earlier this year, I said I reached out to a bunch of people, said, hey, I'm starting this, starting this, and I'd built trust and relationship equity. And so they're like, cool. Like, I don't even know what it is, but I'm in, you know, just because they know you and trust you. Yes. And so it's built and like, you know, you don't want to take advantage of that and ask too many favors and that kind of thing. And you want to provide value and have it, you know, as close to even value exchange as you can. But like, it's just having like people who, who trust and respect you versus trying to like, if I had tried to start that and been like, Hey everyone, like reach or like running out to ads to like a cold audience, like no one would have joined, you know, yeah. but like have being able to leverage that, like anything you do now, like anything you start, you have people in your corner supporting you. And, you know, maybe, maybe like there isn't, so like, actually here's, here's one thing that I kind of do differently or have a different philosophy on, right. Is networking. Like everyone, if you're a salesman, if you're a manager, if you're an entrepreneur, like you're you believe in networking on some level. And so like an RTA, I got in, I said, okay, these people are like-minded. I'm just going to connect with like-minded, good people and good things will happen. Right. But like so many people are like, okay, I'm only going to spend my time getting to know someone if they're in my industry or if they know someone I need access to, or if they have a resource or if they live in the same area, right. They look for that, like 
Yes. You know, what's, what's the direct, like quick benefit from that? Whereas I'm like, okay, I'll like, I don't know. I, I, I hopped on a call with you. We didn't have anything really directly in common, no. but we still hit it off because we had similar values and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And then look at us here like two years later. Yeah. And, um, and so it's like, I tell people like, get, just get on calls, get on zooms with people just to get to know them. If they're good people, like you don't know what's going to come from that. Right. And you also don't know like who they know and, and what they know. And like, cause everyone knows something that you don't. Yeah. And so it's just being curious, seeing how you can provide value. And it's just like, and, and those people have, like, I'm not saying go out and just like have coffee with every person you meet, but <laughs> there's people like, if you share a mastermind or a community, like, you know, on some level, they're already kind of pre-qualified in how they think. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you can do that, that's, that's kind of a shortcut. And so I've been a big believer in masterminds and communities and that kind of stuff too. Um, but yeah, just get to meet the right people and it's just building that relationship capital and same thing, like with my events that I, that I started, like the first one, I only had like a week and a half to promote it. Like it all <laughs> came together, like so last minute, yeah. uh, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe like kind of the behind the scenes of it, but, uh, but all of the people who came was just like, Hey, I'm having an event, like let them know individually. That's another, another huge thing is with marketing. Like everyone wants to, you know, social media, email list, blast it out to everyone. But I've had like, I don't know, 90, 95% of any of my sales or people who show up to the events or people who join the mastermind, it's all from individual reach outs. So like taking that extra step to be like, Hey, Allison, like I got this going on, would really appreciate the support. Like you're going to be like, okay, like he took the time to reach out to me. I'm going to, you know, do what I can versus like, if you just see it on a story, you might be like, Oh, cool. Bradley's doing this, but then, you know, you're going to the next one. So there's so much power in like taking the time and it can be tedious, but to like do those individual reach outs and, and connections with people. You know, I'll tell you something. It, this is so, um, I'm so in line with everything you're saying. And the, the thing about relationships that you're describing, I just know like you're under, underbelly intent really what is that it's when you said add value so when I think about just anywhere I am like as a baseline like as my just my worldview is that anywhere I go I'm going to add value to whatever person mm -hmm. that I meet you know a cashier and I learned that a really really super long time ago I like I just I might've been in a college class with some, I, I think it was in sales or something, but I took it really to heart that like, you know, people will bypass a receptionist or whatever, cause they're going to meet like a top CEO. But when you are like, when you connect with each person that you meet genuinely, mm -hmm. and I think that people are discovering, we were discussing this off camera, people are discovering the slower, smaller increments like I've been saying a lot that, you know, small is a new big, we mm -hmm. have, we have this distorted perception. I think it's distorted that big is big. I don't think it is. Yeah. I think small is big. I think mm -hmm. it's the one, that one conversation where you connect genuinely and it's just, we feel, we feel like urgent and afraid. I think urgency is like, I'm afraid I have to get to the finish line fast. Yeah. But and in Emily talks about, and I realized as I was reading her book and the different things I've learned, like that, the, the, I don't know if you were in the Arate event with a guy who he, he restored Harley back, you know, Harley Davidson hmm. back to, um, it like fell apart and he restored it. Were you at that event? I wasn't at that one. No. So what he did, he explained how he brought Harley Davidson back. And what he said was that any product, anything that you are giving that any um, business that it's never the service or the product that creates loyalty mm. for, um, you know, um, and success. And he proved it, he said, because the thing that really brought Harley Davidson back is the all people want is to be seen. And they want to be delighted in. 
And what mm. they did was they just, so like, I realized that in my business, like, you know, I have this long-term brick and mortar business, multi-location, whatever, but I realized, I'm like, well, how did I get successful? I'm like, it's just like, how, what was I doing? I was just being a therapist, whatever, and just let it grow. But you know what I, it dawned on me is that I really felt a delight when I saw each person walk, like whoever they were, I like felt excited to see them. Mm. And it created like a loyalty and I, it was genuine. Mm. And I feel like what you're describing is this like slow down, build a base perspective and you're methodical, mm. right? Yeah. Are you like that way? Yeah, I try to be. I mean, I think people dismiss the one-to-one -one because they want to go yeah. so fast yes. and really, and they're like, oh, it doesn't scale and that kind of thing. But listen, yeah. it does scale because you build a relationship with one person like you don't know who that person's going to tell. Right. And so eventually like you build enough of these one-on-ones that it's going to spread beyond those one-to-ones, whatever it is you got going on or, you know, your connections. And so it's kind of like Andy and Ed talk about it. Everyone wants to go kind of like what you were saying. People want to go for the home run. Like they think that like, Oh, I meet this one person and that's worth all my time. And it's really about hitting the singles. Right. And those add up and those stack and those, that's what like wins long-term. Um, and then going back to what you said about adding value, because I think a lot of people and myself included in the past would be like, well, how can I add value to these people? You know, like, what do I know? What's my expertise? What do I have to give? And it's like, you, you know, if you can give value directly by teaching someone or giving them some sort of direct benefit, that's great. But a lot of times, like you don't realize how many people just haven't been listened to in a long time. Yeah. Right. So like literally, if you just listen to someone. Uh, that's adding value to their day. A lot of people, like if you genuinely listen with interest and it's not fake and that kind of thing, like someone could leave and they'd be like, man, that like Bradley listened to me, Allison listened to me. Like they remember that, right. Or, or how you made them feel. Or if you bring a good energy to someone, like they're going to be like, man, they're going to be left with that energy and want to want to experience that again and remember you that way. Right. So like, you don't have to have some sort of expertise to bring value to people. You can just listen you can make their day better. You compliment them. Like so many people, like you said, the receptionist, like who, who knows the last time that someone said something nice to her, you know, exactly. listen to her and that kind of thing, especially those people. And, um, and they'll remember that, you know, whereas like, again, like you get the top people, the people who are like, you know, media business moguls or Instagram famous, or, you know, you know who I'm talking about, yeah. and, <laughs> you know, they're, they're getting like complimented and approached all day. And so, you know, it can be hard to kind of break through that noise or, you know, it can be less impactful for them to maybe hear something than it, than it is for that other person. So never, never discount kind of who's who. And there's a lot of, you know, very, very successful people now who like walking down the street, you would have no idea. They're just, they look like average Joes and, you know, or someone sitting next to you on a plane, like you don't know who they are. And so, yeah. you know, there's so many, so many ways to provide value. Um, or, you know, you get to meet someone and then like, you know what they're looking for. And maybe you don't have something for them now, but now you're like aware if you meet someone, you'd be like, oh, you, I got to connect you with this person, yes. right? Yeah. And so it doesn't always have to be like on the spot. So there's a million different ways to provide value. You just have to become like aware and, uh, you know, consciously and subconsciously to start looking for that. And you know what? It's interesting because I really, just knowing you and knowing myself, I feel like really what we mean behind all of this is we genuinely want to make the world a better place. We genuinely care mm -hmm. about people. And as we're talking about it, like the, the benefit of, it's almost like you can hear people be like, people are a means to an end. And I know you don't mean that. Like, I know that about you mm -hmm. like that. It's more like, I feel like so much of the equity we get, because any person you talk to, if you if you're if you're open and you're always looking to learn, you're gonna learn from them. Mm -hmm. I used to when my clients would come in, I used to every time they sat down, I would think, I would see them where they're going, like their greatness, and I would also think, and I would say, God, let them teach me something today. I'm going to mm -hmm. learn something today from them. I would think it. And every mm -hmm. time I did. So it's well, like that. any person you meet, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. who they are. It doesn't matter their intelligence level. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. 
They -hmm. could be like desperate and their life is falling apart and you're learning from them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't have to become like tight friends with everyone you meet, but you can, you can probably learn something from everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. Like just because like saying hi and ask a couple questions, it doesn't mean you have to like dedicate your whole day to that person or do them favors in the future. It's just like, give everyone a chance kind of in a sense, like to make that connection. And yeah. and what you said about like looking at someone as a client, it's like, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with looking at someone and being like, okay, like I could potentially see how they could be a client of mine in the future or something like that. But you just, you don't lead with that. Like you lead, you build a genuine relationship. And then because, cause I don't think there's anything wrong with saying like, oh, me and this person could have a, like a monetarily profitable relationship or whatever it might be. But if you just look at them like a price tag or like a piece of meat or whatever it might be, then that's the wrong way to go about it. So you can still have that view. Like, man, like, like, uh, say, say you build a relationship with someone like an Andy or an Ed, and you know that they have incredible access to resources that could help you. And maybe you'll, you'll ask them one day, but like, if you go in, like they can smell that you know, if that's your intention. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can, you can still build relationships and kind of still filter like, you know, who, who may be a customer of mine in the future. But again, it's just how you go about it. And like the, the real intent, you know, if you're just like stringing them along because you want them to like be in your pipeline your Rolodex or whatever, you know, it might work out for you, but Long term, like you know, it's kind of sleazy to do it that way. <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. And and like, I don't know. Eventually, like the people who do that, it it they get exposed, and yeah. then your reputation shot, or you know, people are like, oh, don't stay away from him, like he's a leech or whatever it might be. Yeah. And so, like, you you're not gonna fool people for long with that approach. You know what I think also, and I think about this often, even when I was like like talking to Emily, I was thinking like that. And just even just on a smaller scale for me, like being a leader of like a business or whatever, like Mm -hmm. people will assume that that they'll hold back from you. So I feel Mm -hmm. like, you know, even like I was noticing even with Emily, like I, there were things I really genuinely wanted to say to her because I, of what I value about her. But then there's this thing that makes you think, oh, she doesn't want to hear that, or she's going to be, she's not going to want to know that or Ed or Andy, like, but the truth is, is that they probably, even though they get so much attention, it's probably lonely and that people, they don't know who they can trust. Right. They just want to be treated like normal people. Like, yes. yeah, Yeah. Like, so like, if you feel like, you know, people like, how do you know, especially as you start to get more and more successful, you don't know, like, I've noticed, like, I've stopped, like, I mean, I said it on here, but I I don't say a lot of what I have or what I do, like, just Mm -hmm. even just to strangers, because I start to think, oh, like, I want them to like me, I want them to know me, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's, um, I try to think about that. Like, I wonder how it feels for them, you know, Mm -hmm. to be like Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. You, um, you were talking, I don't want to forget, and I'm kind of interrupting my own self right now, but what I, I, you, we were talking about this thing about, we're noticing how we've taken, we take in all this information, learning, growing, personal development. And Mm -hmm. I was saying like how I just feel like now I just want to be quiet and apply it. And we were saying how we're noticing people slowing down and, and, um, you know, thinking and, uh, mm-hmm. and being. So I just wanted to talk to you more about that. Cause I think it's really valuable in this yeah. busy world. Right. Yep. So like, what, what were you, what were you saying off camera? Cause I want people to hear it. Yeah. Well, I feel like there's seasons, right? Mm-hmm. Like seasons we go through, like when I remember when I was starting out, like I, kind of mentioned in my story, like just starting to get into personal development. Like I didn't read books growing up, especially like nonfiction and that sort of thing. And as I got into, I kind of caught this like uh, desire to learn about myself, about people, about business, about all these different topics. And I started consuming all this information. It was just like consume, 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 consume. And I didn't apply anything for probably like I don't know, I'll cut, like really apply anything like where I'd like be able to like take it and process it and be like, okay, I'm going to use this right away for a few years. Like I had this 
uh, period of just like kind of almost getting like a base level of knowledge, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, everyone says, take action, take action, apply. I think the context matters. Like I think starting out, you do need that kind of base level of knowledge. That's why we have like the education system doesn't have you, they have you go through middle school and then high school and then college, like all these years of consuming. And then you go out and get and start applying, get a job. Right. And I think it's the same if you're an entrepreneur or anything else, you need to kind of create that base level of, of knowledge about all these different things. And then you can start to like, cause knowledge is just like all these different stacks or parts of a web. Right. And, but then like the pieces start connecting. Right. Yeah. Or the analogy I like to use is like every, every book you consume is like a Lego set that you're dumping into your big pile of knowledge. Right. And then like yes. the more pieces that you have in there together, the more different things you can build and make connections with, if that makes sense. It makes so much sense. And is there's yeah. a synergy you're creating other things from the, like there's more than what you have. Exactly. You're building something different and bigger. Yeah. Right? You're getting more pieces that you can then put together into new ideas and new things. And so your potential grows. And so yes. you need like a certain amount in there. And then at a certain point, it's like, okay, it's time to start building. Mm -hmm. You know, so you start taking those different pieces and putting them together. Then you might get to a point where you're like, oh crap, like I'm missing a piece and you go acquire that piece and that knowledge. Right. And it continues to stack and build and you build bigger and better things. Yeah. And so uh, I can't remember when I thought of that analogy, but that's the best one I've it's a thought really of good one. like how, how knowledge connects and builds on itself. Mm -hmm. So you need that period, but then at a certain point, like, okay, let's say you've amassed like this big, huge box of Legos and you're not building anything. Yeah. Like what good is that doing right at a certain point, you got to take it and start using it. Mm -hmm. So I think as people get stuck in that cycle of like consume, 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 and then they never apply. Yes. So, uh, at a certain point, like I got to probably just in the last like year or two where I got to a point where I'm like, all right, I feel like a lot of what I'm starting to hear now is repeats of stuff that I've already consumed. And so maybe that's a sign that I need to just like, I, I know enough and I need to start moving forward. Mm -hmm. So you'll yeah. kind of get a, a grasp of that. And like you, we were talking about like on our walks, like we both go on a lot of walks, mm -hmm. you know, for probably a year straight, I walk every day and I listen to a podcast or an audio book or whatever. And then at a certain point I was like, man, I, it feels like I've heard it already. Not that I like, I know everything. Cause that's the furthest yeah. thing from the truth, but where I was like, okay, now I need some time to like, I need some quiet. I need some space to conceptualize and put the pieces together and think through my, my own thoughts and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So once you get to that point, then it becomes more of a, like apply, 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 and then fill in the gaps. Right. Cause yes. you're going to run into things where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm missing this. I don't have this answer yet. Um, so your, so your consumption gets more selective, yes. right? Like I used to just read anything and everything I could get my hands on and listen to anything. And now I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm applying. And now I have this piece that I'm like, I'm missing this. So no, let me go find the answer to that. So it's kind of like this evolution, right? And yeah. then quiet time. Um, I think the more we have going on, especially in like this kind of hyper fast, hyper connected world, the more time we need to like disconnect, spend time in our own heads, get away from the dopamine hits yes. and, uh, and find that quiet and think. And like you, you hear about kind of CEOs, like what's, what's the CEO's main job in like a big business? It's to make think. decisions. Yeah. yeah think and make decisions. decisions right. Mm -hmm. And Ed Milet yeah, said at the RT event, he said, thinking is just the act of asking and answering questions in your own mind. Right. Yes. So you get better and better at that process, but it, you need yes. time to answer and ask those questions and work through those things. So like the, the highest paid people in the world, they're, they're just paid to as the best thinkers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so if they're constantly consuming and constantly just listening to other people, they can't do that. So yes. it's kind of, it, you really have to be checking on. It's this, on yourself. It's like this dynamic kind of thing where, all right, I need to consume and get that base level. And, th but then also I think, I think no action. I think all action are both wrong. Like yeah. you need to be, even when you're consuming a lot, maybe you're still taking baby steps and testing things out and learning. And then like, as you're, as you go on that, that skew changes, right? So you go from like less consumption to more action. Yeah. And if you go to like, if you start out full action and you just start putting things together, like you got no Legos to build with, like yeah. 
you know, that's where I see people like just start and fail and start and fail in the beginning. And then they get discouraged mm-hmm. because they didn't take the time. So it's, it's really kind of like a complex answer, I guess <laughs> there's yeah. no right answer, but it's always like anything it's dynamic, it's changing, but I think it depends on kind of what season or, or what space you're at. And it's not just a one-time gathering of that base knowledge, right? If you switch businesses or switch careers or interests, now you have to go like build that base again mm-hmm. in whatever it is you're moving towards. You know, I, um, what you're saying is just so cool because just having the conversation two people having a conversation too creates more like that mm-hmm. synergy. Yeah. And I was taking like writing, jotting things down as you were talking because studies have shown, there's a few things that throw some fun facts in like that people are motivated for, they figured it out about 90 days you know, and the word motivation is not actually, they they will hold on to a vision for about that time. And then it starts to wane off. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so it's interesting to me that, you know, so w- when you're saying too much action, it's like, then it's like, you can also then you're on your own and you get, you can get lost in just like thinking you can do everything yourself. And then there's the part where our brains actually every single our brains move through those the brain waves right you know and and most of us are in high beta all day long that's the alert stage of the brain yeah. and we move into beta which is still alert but high beta is str- a stress um mm-hmm. wave but then as we move through the brain waves a lot of times we hop into um bed and we can barely sleep our sleep is broken but yeah. I actually have my point is, is that as you move into alpha, right, as you move into these brain waves, there's a process where when your brain rests and gets into a, this different wave pattern, that's when your brain takes all of the data that's been collected through your five senses, and it categorizes it. And it puts it in the Mm. right spots. So that's why when you wake up in the morning, you're like, so now you're in a state where you can now make better decisions. But that's Mm -hmm. why when people are in chronic stress mode, they're so it could even be considered when we're consuming, consuming, it can be chronic stress mode. I noticed for myself that my um, consumption, even though I love to learn, so it's not, it's not all or nothing, but I started to notice that a lot of it had to do that. I was, I'm like, oh, I have to learn something again now, right now. And I realized, wait a minute, that's insecurity. Mm -hmm. Because in because I also walk, listen to podcasts, I'm always learning. And I'm like, wait a second. So I started asking myself, like what you're saying, questions. Mm-hmm. Like to be, like, this is what I do for a living. I'm an expert question asker. Like, <laughs> yep. why not ask myself the questions? Yeah. And it, the data that's in there, what you can learn from your what you what you already have is incredible. And I think that we are actually learning again. When we take that data that's in there and we reprocess it through questions and doing something, that's more learning, right? Mm -hmm. We're actually getting more information by taking it and utilizing it. Do you know what I'm saying by that? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Cause I've, I've been in that high beta, like can't shut it off state Mm -hmm. a lot more than I'd I'd like to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I know that exact feeling, especially even, even like this week kind of been a phase of that, you know, more than usual. A lot of times when we're looking to like, okay, well, let me, um, let me not leave that quiet. It's, it's a distraction also like, like we're like, okay, if we like put on something external, like it'll, uh, I'm learning, like we justify it by saying like, oh, it's good information and and all that stuff. But a lot of times it's distraction. It's just like, okay, I I need to think about this. So I'm not thinking about the real problem at hand. Yes. And so that that can be a difficult and scary thing to, you know, sit with. Um, but it's, it's important. And a lot of people will never sit with it. They'll just seek out more and more distraction, stronger and stronger distraction as that gets more and more uncomfortable. And then it's kind of like a slippery slope from there that gets hard to, to come out of. But one thing that I've found to be very useful when you said like asking yourself the questions is creating this, this vision or this version of your highest self, yes. right? So what does that look like when you're, let's, you're, you're wealthy, you're in the best shape possible. Everything's clicking on all cylinders. You're happy, you're fulfilled and you create this version of yourself. And then you ask it questions. 
Yes, right? I do because that. It's, yes. it's, a, it's, this, it's this weird thing. It's like your subconscious knows the answers, yes. but you need to like separate it somehow. Right. So like, I, I'll close my eyes and be like, it's like when I'm especially stressed or when I'm like searching for answers, I'll be like, all right, like, and then, and then my future or my highest self will like speak to me and be like, all right, Bradley, like calm down. Like here's, and it always has an answer. It's weird. I can't explain it. Or like, it knows how to talk to me because it is me. Yes. You know what I mean? It knows what, what I need. And so it's a very, very simple, but powerful uh, exercise that I found myself using more and more lately. It's like, you know, you know, don't worry, you got this, you you know, you'll be me soon. And um, here, here's like, you know, you're stuck in this way of thinking, but you know, have you thought of this and it's a good way to break the patterns that we, we constantly go through and recycle. Like we're pounding our head against the wall, thinking the same disempowering thoughts and stuff. And so it's a good way to interrupt and kind of focus on what you need to focus on. Right. Cause you're like, if you, if you're like, cause you know, your highest version of yourself is not yes. going to be stuck in the same patterns and modes and negative self-talk that you might be in. Right. I, I just can't believe you're saying, cause I do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I actually show up like in my, like my future, like mm -hmm. everything I, I would value in myself that I'm beating myself up for that. I'm not today, whatever. And yeah. I feel so much love coming from her and comfort. Mm -hmm. It's like, almost like, you know, there's all these different philosophies, but it's like reparenting yourself. Like, yeah. no, this is a better way to go. This will, this will take you where I am, you know? Yep. And it's like, I, I just did this post about like Dorothy, you know, that, you know, um, you had the power within you all along, my dear, that Glinda, the good witch says to, do you know, you know that like, um, Wizard of Oz? yeah. So yeah. when she, um, you know, she's in this search forever, right. For, um, and I, and somebody commented on the post, they're like, well, you know, did she have to go, you know, why did these girls have to go through all these struggles? I don't understand. I went through this whole thing and I'm like, well, think about it. She slapped the most, she slapped the lion to protect her friend, like this ferocious thing. Like she had to, she killed the, the, her biggest enemy that was trying to kill her. Like all these things that she did before she, but, and where she was, the home she was at, she didn't want to be at. So like she created this whole experience through struggle and then found out she has it within her all along all along to get where she wants to be in her life. It's such a great message. And we all have that, mm -hmm. you know? And it's yeah. like, we, I think that we're so afraid. If you think about high beta, right? That mm -hmm. high stress mode. Yeah. You know what I think that like for me is like, oh, oh, that's like wherever I am, I should be somewhere else. Mm. So I'm here now, I'm doing this thing. It's like, oh, I should be doing that. You know, mm -hmm. like, even if it's, you're doing the dishes, I should, I shouldn't be doing the dishes. I should be, like the, like think about like stress is fear. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. And, and the question, the great question is, what are you afraid of? Like what yeah. would happen if you didn't do that today or whatever it is like, and then you really ask the question, it's not really not much. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they won't like me. And so that's, I'm terrified of that. Right. Mm -hmm. But what really, what does it matter? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and some of it's legitimate, right? Because stress is this response that is kind of supposed to make us take action, right? Yes. And so sometimes that uh, that stress or that fear is kind of imaginary, like you said, like, uh, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Not much. Sometimes if you don't take the action, there, there are big consequences. So yeah. it's learning like which types of fear and stress you need to respond to, like which are mm -hmm. legitimate, which are not. Um, which can be, you know, easier said than done. But think about it, Bradley, like if that stress that comes, you know, you have to do that thing and it's important, it's valuable. Mm -hmm. But if you know it without fear, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. this, so the fear is the driver. So if you can shift the fear to like, um, and I, I practice, I try to figure this out. Like, okay, maybe, maybe you can help me with this. Like, think about, so, cause that, that propels us places, you know, like the fear of not getting somewhere, but then what, what if it wasn't fear, but it was like, I know I'm going there and I'm deciding to go there. I'm just wondering, 
can we pivot from so much of it? Cause we're the, the anxiety is pushed on us, right? Mm -hmm. Like social media, like get, you know, you're not where you, like, you're not where you belong. Hurry, mm -hmm. go now. Don't yeah. rest. <laughs> yep. Get the fuck going. Right. And I believe in that. Like I'm, I'm driven like that. Well, I mean, what right. do you think of that? I'm curious. Cause I know that you you're driven. Yeah. You seem so calm. You know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably one of the, like, the big, I, I probably have more contrast between my inner and outer world than most people. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you're a wreck on the inside. No, I don't know. If, I don't know if a wreck is the right, <laughs> right word, but like going at a hundred miles an hour, like yes. I have a very, very difficult time shutting off and yeah. getting going, you know? So like, you know, my, like my wife, Nancy, she hits the pillow and like, she's out, you know, whereas I lay there and I'm like, there's this freight train of like thoughts going through my head that I can't like slow down sometimes. And I'll, I'll just like, I'll stay up forever. You know, like last night was one of those nights. And then, um, what were they, what was going on in your head? Uh, worries uh, or thoughts or questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mostly worries or like, I'm thinking about, you know, you think about your to-do list the next day, you think about kind of those problems. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it, Nine times out of 10, it has to do with kind of financial stress Yeah, uh, personally. And, you know, everyone has their own things. Some people it's relationships, some people it's, um, it could be anything addiction. I don't, you know, it could be a thousand different things, but for me, that's usually kind of the, the perpetual like worry machine. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's like, it's being fed by kind of those, those sorts of fears and yes. insecurities and that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, it can be really tough to shut off, uh, eventually eventually you do but then also like you wake up and it's like boom the thing's still moving like 60 miles an hour but then also if i take enough time off of something and get away from it like it slows down and quiets and it takes me a longer time also to kind of get back into like like if i took a vacation and i'm getting back into work it takes me like wow. days to really kind of get back up to speed where i'm like mm -hmm. in that mode yes and um so like i have a hard time falling asleep i also am slow to wake up like I tend to not like be one of those people who hops out of bed and you're wide awake. Like it takes me a long time to kind of like get going. Whereas again, my wife, you know, she falls asleep fast. Once she's up, she's up, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of like this. And, and I find it's interesting because it correlates with emotions too. So like emotionally, she can go like, boom, boom, boom. And like, just go from like happy to pissed to sad to <laughs> elated, you know, and like back and forth and like switch these emotions so fast yes. for me. I'll hold like a good emotion and it takes me a lot to, to get into like a negative place. But then once I'm in that negative place, it takes a lot for me to get out. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's weird because the ability, I, it, it makes sense, I guess, when you think about it, but your ability to change your thoughts and emotions, like, and shut them off being hard for me also correlates to me being it, like changing states, emotional states, That's you know, really where like, cool. so she can, she can turn her mind on and off. She can also bounce it back and forth between both spectrums of the emotion. So it's really interesting kind of, I don't know if that's just like coincidence with us or if that's kind of everyone, but um, it's something I think to be self-aware of. So I know like for me, when I'm getting like into that stage where I'm like, all right, I'm going to be pissed off. Like she'll get pissed off at me, right? Just like any wife. And she'll be like super angry for like 10 minutes and then get over it and like move on. Me, like if I'm pissed, like it's lasting like hours, you know, yeah. it's going to take a while, but th then also the same thing. I don't get to that state as easily. So it's, Oh, I have a few things to say about this. I figured you might. I do. Am <laughs> I allowed? Can I say yeah, it? For sure. I love what you're saying. And because you're putting it in, so in a way that's just different mm. than, I mean, I, he I, obviously I hear things like this all the time, but the way that you're right. describing it is very insightful. And I'm thinking, so I, I'm just, can I ask you questions? I'm just curious about them. Sure. So, yeah. You, you went like this. I, I'm going to, I'm going to analyze <laughs> the fudge out of you. You, you go like this. You go, sure. You go, sure. I, I <laughs> you know shivered for a second. I got a <laughs> little shiver no, down my spine. Yeah. You said yes with your mouth and no with your body. <laughs> the Let's body, do it. But, okay. So this is my question. So mm -hmm. Do you, you're saying it takes you a long time to get to that, you know, that lower mood, right? Mm -hmm. But now 
is it that it's a longer time or is it that it's accumulating, that there's micro experiences that are building along the way that you're maybe letting go and not addressing? I don't know if you're doing it or not, but it could be, you know, like, mm -hmm. is it that maybe not you're not aware that you're going lower and then you're, you know, and then you, when you get to that point where it's the greater, greatest discomfort, that's when the awareness is like more heightened. Now I'm really pissed, you know, is that part of it? Um, but the way I I've, I've thought about it is like, you say you have the state line. That's kind of like a neutral baseline of emotions. Like you said that I'm saying, picture that, okay. right? Okay. So okay. say you have like okay. kind of okay. this, <laughs> line right that's like positive negative yes, above right. and below got it. it got it like for her like nancy she's like she'll fluctuate above and below pretty i got easily. it yeah and me i'm like more stuck to that neutral so it's also harder like it's harder for me to go way below it but it's also harder for me to go no i got that it. part right yeah and then it's almost like if i get to a certain point then it's like past like you know critical mass that i'm like stuck up there or i'm stuck down there you know what yeah, i mean no i got it yeah, but yeah. this is what the part that I'm curious about the part mm -hmm. where you where you actually move her movements fast I get it you're saying could I be moving without realizing it I'm wondering do you know Possible. you're moving do you know you're moving when you're moving when you hit critical mass had you known during that period of time you were moving or did you just feel neutral um that's a good question I think it depends a little bit on each individual kind of situation but um because yeah, think I about think it. At, think at about a what certain, you're saying. If yeah. you're saying, like, let's say you're mad at something, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a is it a series of things or is it suddenly you're mad at one thing? It's probably a series of things where but where one thing is what like kind of finally sets yes, it. Yes, this yeah. is my point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Then you do you hear what I'm saying to you? Yes. Yeah. What am I saying? So you're saying that I'm more similar to her than I think, but just I think you're experiencing things. I think you're also tell me if I'm wrong. I'm totally yeah. going out on this because I think I in a way get some things, but I think you're um you're um a curious person. I think you see mm -hmm. things from very different, like you'll see many vantage points. I see things from a lot of angles, yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So then if something happens, it feels a little shitty you're probably able to say, well, that's probably because of this mm -hmm. and this. You're probably able to Reframe be reasonable it. about it. Mm -hmm. But then let's say something similar happens and then you're you're doing that regularly, but you're yep. not maybe necessarily taking care of yourself in that moment because you're you're pretty reasonable dude, mm -hmm. right? Right. But then it's or you're like, I'll just get through it and move on kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So it's like the, the big thing would be that see she's in real time, but her, her heights, I mean, I don't want to talk about Nancy, mm -hmm. perfect Nancy, but like, yeah. you know, <laughs> but even like for anyone, like if I have an extreme emotion, which I can inside, mm -hmm. it's like learning how not to be in a reactive state. Mm -hmm. So it's being able to be in a creative state to ask the question and not jump to conclusions, not to be immediately mad. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're maybe doing some of the, you know, letting it go and some of the easier going stuff, but maybe not addressing it because it's not like taking care of yourself in that moment. Right. Like, yeah. hey, you know, did you really, when I walked in and you looked that way, I kind of felt like you were mad at me. Did you feel mad at me? Mm -hmm. And then- and like actually ask the question mm -hmm. to clear it up. So clear up, you know, and then you don't, then you're not there because why yeah. do you think it takes a long time for you to get back? Because to me, it tells me it's not really fixed. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. Should I not be asking these questions? Did I forget it's not therapy? <laughs> no, I mean, I like cross over to like a really like a stop, Allison. You no, it's interesting. I've never, I've never actually been to therapy, so um, I've always kind of like, wondered, you know, yeah. what it would be like and that sort of thing. And I try and like do therapy on myself in my head, right through <laughs> these back and forth. Well, thoughts, this is but, what I would say to yeah. do. It's like so. It's really it's asking that additional question. You just yeah. you map that out logically for me, which mm -hmm. made sense. You're like, 
oh, Nancy goes all the way up and then all the way down and she's very quick. And you said it in a way that's really super positive and you know, you're not negative in any way. Mm -hmm. And then you described yourself and you, you, the way that you described both of you emotionally and state of being wise is I'm going to be honest with you in a fixed mindset. This mm -hmm. is how we are. I don't ever buy Generally that. speaking. Yeah. In the moment, like maybe in the snapshot. Yeah. This is how we're operating. But to me, it's always changeable because, it, you know, because really we have the power over our emotional state. If our emotional state, if we're reacting to anything outside of ourselves, we have an external locus of control and we're in trouble eventually. Right. Yeah. So like being able to take whatever that external thing, I don't care. You're like, well, this is what I do. I stay there a long time. Well, do you want to stay there a long time? No. <laughs> you no, you don't have to. I'm, I'm speaking, right. I guess, in terms of generalities and natural set points. Yes. Because they yes. have changed, right? So like, you know, she used to be like, yes. and she's still like that compared to me, yes. but she's, she's gotten in much more control, right? Because we've yes. talked about it and like worked through some of it. Yeah. And like me, I used to just like literally bottle up everything. And now like, yes. you know, I'm able to share and express some of that. Still got a long ways to go. But even, even though we're kind of both getting like, better i guess if that makes or like closer yes. to you know learning to deal with that like that's still kind of our natural tendencies you could say you know what i love about what you're saying because like in a marriage or you know th there's like a seesaw mm -hmm. so like you know you, you just did it so it's like you know when somebody's like and i'm not saying either one of you is over or under functioning i'm just using that mm -hmm. as a term so it's like if somebody's under functioning and some th there's always somebody over functioning you know, mm -hmm. so yeah. in a relationship, so you want to like both move, you know, right. to being yeah. more balanced, like a seesaw. But what I'm thinking with you is so cool. Cause I, I, I mean, I just can tell that you guys are reasonable. I know. I mean, I don't see her as like, like, you know, cray cray at all. You know, you can <laughs> see she's like a great thinker and he's, you know, easy to talk to, but I wonder like, like what you describe is that it's always, it makes me think about how human beings, when you're in the same room with people, you're sharing brain waves. So you would mm -hmm. like, when I see you putting your hand up and down the way she's doing it, and then the way that your, your wave is, it's like, you're starting to get more in sync, right. Mm -hmm. With one another, yeah. which is like natural when you live with someone. Mm -hmm. I, no. Yeah. So, so I feel like what you, you're doing is creating like this harmony and it's all about communicating with one another right and being yeah. on time yeah and it, it's interesting too because um at a certain point you almost like that i think the beauty of a good relationship is that when one person's down the other person's able to elevate their emotion to help bring the other person mm -hmm. back up mm -hmm. right and so there's this constant like flip-flopping almost right like whenever it seems like whenever she's real low i'm able to kind of step in and be like you know what it's it's and like kind of hold the presence and then when i'm down she's able to sense it and kind of lift me back up as well and so but that's something that like takes time whereas like in the beginning it'd be like you know one of us gets pissed the other one gets pissed and then we're both just like in a low state and it's really hard to get out of yes right? yes so i mean we've been together almost eight years and it probably took the first like five four five before that even started becoming like a thing and we started talking through these more kind of complex uh communication styles and that kind of thing so it's uh again it's it's not as easy as it sounds but like you know eventually when you get there it's it's pretty cool to see i think like even what you're describing like it's like almost like when that person in front of you is down let's say before you were, ref you each were reflecting, like if they're down, it's almost like you, it's like, you're not separate enough to, you just go like, down. Like with codependency, them. right? Codependency yeah. where like, if your yeah. partner's upset, you're upset. If they're happy, you're happy. Yeah. You know, versus kind of being your own person and being able, because like, you know, we have, we know some people who are like that and like they fight all the time because then they, one gets mad, the other gets mad and then they clash or, you know, yeah. but then like when things are good, like things are great because the other one's like matching the other one, yes. you know? And so you have this, like, it's, everything's either super positive or super negative, mm -hmm. right? And there's none of that balancing going on. And then that's, that's where you see relationships where like, you know, they break up every three weeks and then they get back together and then yeah. things are great. And then they're fighting and it's just like, 
you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think a lot of that comes back to figuring yourself out and being your own person and doing that, that inner work and Isn't not being so it, dependent really? on. Yeah. Because yeah. like being responsible for the three feet around us, mm. like, you know, th- if you think about like that, like um, with you and Nancy, like, do you see that? Like, let's say you're going to have a conversation. Let's say Nancy's upset with you. Like, I I always have people do this thing where they listen without an agenda. So there's no defense. Like, mm-hmm. just be able to hear Nancy, just her. Like, even mm-hmm. if she's saying, you know, you suck, whatever, <laughs> you know, you did this. Or it, when you just hear to understand and love her, and it doesn't have anything to do with you, it's transformative yeah. because if you're just listening to her, I could understand how you feel that way, Nancy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, without having to apologize or explain, because it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be your own person. Like it's part of being in a relationship, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of the biggest breakthroughs that we had probably, again, just in the last couple of years is that mm-hmm. we try to like, you know, we we get pissed at each other all the time, just like in any any relationship, right? And it's learning to be like, okay, we're on the same team. So I'm not fighting you. We're both fighting this problem, this third party yes, together. Exactly. Right, right? And that's like, it, it's, it sounds like maybe simple or like abstract, but it's such a huge shift in how you deal with conflict. Cause now like, you know, if, if she calls me a name or I call, I mean, we, we don't name call, but like, if we go at the other person, right. Or accuse them of acting a certain way, like what happens, the defenses go up. Right. Whereas if you come at it from like, Hey, you know, I noticed this, let's talk about it, how we're going to fix it. Like you create this kind of third part and then you can both like, you're, you're not going at each other. You're not attacking each other, you know? And so it, it makes it much easier to like resolve that because your defenses aren't as high and you're working as a team. No, I problem. can't believe like you've never been to therapy because that's like a thing. Like you get on the same <laughs> side of the issue. Like we give people a pillow and mm-hmm. like, usually people are fighting over, like, this is your conflict. And then they're fighting mm-hmm. over the pillow instead of getting oh, on cool. the same yep. side of it and saying, mm-hmm. no, this is something we're going to work on together. It's not like right or wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just, you just naturally came to that because you are insightful people, I think. Right. Yeah. Just because I realized that like when you, you know, I learned this growing up and what it's just that if you go at someone, like you're never going to win them over by attacking them right? Okay. Like no progress is ever going to be made. Like you, I mean, I don't know if maybe it was politics I looked at where I'm like, you know what, these people, they attack each other and there's never any middle ground or headway and, yeah, you know, and you're never going to find it by going at it. It's just human nature, right? If someone comes at like you, you naturally defend, you naturally fight back. And mm-hmm. so how are you going to resolve conflict that way by creating more conflict? 